So welcome to the Steps to Healing and Wholeness. This is a process that's designed to be used as a follow-up to the Steps to Freedom in Christ by Dr. Neil T. Anderson. It's similar to the Steps to Freedom in Christ, but focuses particularly on issues around health and wholeness, though any Christian will find it helpful. And if you haven't already done the Steps to Freedom in Christ, it is okay just to go straight into this. And so what you're going to do is you're going to close any doors in your life that have been opened to the enemy through past sin so that you can remove any influence he has, those footholds whereby he can hold you back. Throughout the process, you'll also be asking the Holy Spirit to show you areas of your belief system that are not in line with what is actually true according to God's word so that you can then go on to take steps to renew your mind which, of course, according to the Bible, is how you will be transformed. The process we're going to go through follows broadly the teaching in the eight sessions of our Keys to Health, Wholeness and Fruitfulness course, and we're assuming that you've been through that course, so we won't duplicate too much of the teaching as we go through. So, in summary, really, this is for you, if you want to make sure that your thinking about health in particular is in line with God's word, if you have a particular health issue that you'd like to address by bringing it before God and making sure that you have done everything that you have responsibility to do, or you simply want to take some time to offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice and commit to being the person that he is calling you to be and to do the things he's prepared in advance for you to do. In other words, you don't have to have a particular health issue. It's just good to get radically right with God. If you do have a particular concern about health that you are entering this process for, let's bear in mind that there are a number of possible causes for health issues. We're whole people, spirit, mind and body, and we need to take the whole of reality into account. So if a Christian has a condition that turns out to be caused by a spiritual issue, a foothold of the enemy in some way, then they can have every expectation that it can be completely resolved as they choose to submit to God and resist the devil during this process. If the root of the condition is a mind issue, a faulty belief, then again, you can have confidence that during this process, if you're open to him, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth and will reveal to you the faulty thinking. Then you can work on changing that faulty thinking, renewing your mind, and over time, you can expect to see transformation as you bring your belief system into line with God's word. If the condition is caused purely by a physical issue, you can be assured that your body is just a temporary tent you live in. In the future, there is this wonderful, perfect new body waiting for you. And you can be assured that God will use the difficulties you face to deepen your character. And of course, his goal for your life is godly character, becoming more and more like Jesus. So let's not come into this process with the primary objective of being healed. I don't think being physically healthy is a good enough objective in and of itself. Let's come to make sure that we are radically right with God so that he can use us to the fullest possible extent. So we're gonna be able to make sure uh, if we have a physical issue that we have done everything that's within our power and responsibility to do and then with confidence at the end, we can commit ourselves to God's mercy and wisdom and let him decide if there's gonna be some kind of supernatural overriding of biological laws or not. We trust him as a good father that he is. So we're gonna introduce you to each part of the process and we'll say the opening prayer together. 
for example, um, in each section. And you are then going to spend time alone with God. This is a process just between you and him. So if you are doing this as part of a, a group, maybe who's, who's just gone through the course, uh, if you are in the kind of facility that allows it, I recommend that in those times you spread out and get as alone as possible, uh, even though there's a lot of other people there. Uh, don't, try not to be next to anyone else, just alone with God, so that you can just pray to him, just you and him. This is not a kind of group confessional where you're going to be asked to share anything with anybody else. It's just between you and God. I hope that sounds okay. So you'll find the process um, towards the back of your participants guide for keys to health, wholeness and fruitfulness. And we're going to start by praying the opening prayer out loud together. And if you're watching this on video, I'd encourage you to pray it aloud too. So let's pray. Lord God, you are the creator of all things. You are the one true God. You alone know the end from the beginning. There is none like you. I come humbly before you this day. Thank you for freely welcoming me into your presence. I affirm that Jesus Christ is my Lord and that everything I am and have belongs to you. My desire is to be the person you are calling me to be and to do the things that you have prepared in advance for me to do. You have promised to give wisdom to those who ask you for it. I humbly ask you to give me wisdom today and reveal to me everything you want me to know particularly about my health, wholeness, and fruitfulness. Please show me all the areas in my life where I have allowed the enemy a foothold in order that I may turn away from my sin and remove any influence he may have. I ask your Holy Spirit to lead me into all truth and to show me where my belief system is not in line with what is actually true according to your word, so that I may renew my mind to the truth. I pray this in the name of Jesus, who died for my wholeness and rose again to give me life in all its fullness. Amen. And now, if there is a specific health issue or issues that you wish to bring before God during this time, there's a prayer that we'll pray out loud together. And we'll pause at the end of the first line I specifically bring before you, just to give you a little opportunity to mutter or whisper, you know, no one else has to hear, what it is that you want to bring to God in this time. Um, so just tell God silently in your minds if you prefer, and then we'll carry on with the rest of the prayer. Is that okay? So a little pause and then I'll tell you when to carry on. So let's pray this prayer. Lord God, I specifically bring before you Let's carry on. I pray that during this time you will reveal to me the root causes, whether spiritual, mental or physical and give me the strength to deal with those that are within my area of responsibility. My desire is for healing, and I humbly ask you for that. But my greatest desire, Father, is to be a fruitful disciple of Jesus, who is used mightily by you. I commit my whole self, including my physical body, into your hands, and I choose to trust you regarding whether I am healed or not. I simply ask that you have your way in me. In Jesus' name, amen. As you begin this time of prayerful reflection, it's good to consider the story of your life. Take some time to write down a timeline of your life 
from beginning to now and ask the Holy Spirit, give him an opportunity to highlight certain things that he would want you to deal with during the process. So let's ask God to help us with this. Let's pray together. Lord God, as I reflect on my life, I pray for your wisdom. Please guide my thoughts and please begin to help me understand some of the things you want me to address today. In Jesus' name, Amen. So in this time, go back as far as you can and remember and notice all the key events in your life, both positive and negative. The space in your participant's guide to write it all down. If you have particular health issues, then what's the story of the illness or the symptoms that you're experiencing? Was there something else that happened at the time that illness started? Maybe a bereavement or a trauma or a stressful situation or some form of loss. Think about people who've influenced your life, be it positively or negatively, especially at that time. Are there patterns of illness in your family lines? Think about your parents, grandparents, as far back as you know and make a list of all the illnesses that you know they struggled with. So just take some time to do that now. Okay, you may like to look back to your story as we go through the process. It will hopefully prompt you from time to time. We're going to start by considering the worldview we developed as we grew up and ask God to show us where it's not in line with how he tells us the world actually is. Our worldview has a great effect on how we attempt to deal with health issues. Consider your typical course of action when faced with illness in yourself or someone else. Where do you turn? Is it for spiritual help, physical help, alternative therapy help, or to God? Let's ask God to show us specifically where our belief system in that area is wrong. So let's pray together. Lord, Lord God, God, I recognize that I have followed the ways of this world and have developed a set of core beliefs that are not in line with what you tell me in your word is actually true. I have had these beliefs for so long and they are so deeply ingrained that it is difficult for me to recognize them. I pray that you would reveal to me all my faulty beliefs in order that I might renew my mind and live according to what is actually true. I recognize that my faulty worldview has influenced the way I have learned to view sickness and healing. Please help me see where I have believed things that are not true. I pray in the name of Jesus, who is the truth. Amen. You will see a number of lists describing some of the key beliefs of common worldviews. Please take some time to consider them and put a mark next to the ones that you think are relevant to you. Note that the lists are by no means exhaustive and the Holy Spirit may prompt you about other beliefs you picked up from your education, your culture or religion. There is space for you to write in other things that come to mind. When you are happy that you have a complete list and do take your time to do this well, move on to the prayer that comes after the lists. You'll see that there is a place 
where you include the specific false beliefs that are marked. Recognizing a faulty belief and rejecting it is a good start, but it's only a start. It takes time and effort to replace those faulty beliefs with truth. You may want to write a stronghold buster for one or more of the items you identified. We'll talk more about that later. Well, hopefully you're getting the idea of how this works, asking God to show you some things, a list to tick, and then a prayer to deal with those things. That's how the rest of the process will work too. So we're going to move on to consider God's plan for our lives. And let's go straight into the prayer in the section entitled, Embracing God's Plan for My Life. Father, thank you that I am not an accident and that you laid out the days of my life before I was even born. Thank you that you have a purpose for my life and specific things for me to do which you have prepared in advance. Please show me now where I have not lived in accordance with this amazing fact. Amen. So in the pattern that will become familiar, I'll give you some time now to mark the options relevant to you and to deal with them in the prayer that you will find in this section. Okay, let's continue. Our spirits are now alive and connected to God. They have been gloriously, wonderfully, 100% restored to how they were meant to be. But we're now going to cover four areas that might be preventing us from seeing the benefits throughout our being of that fact, of that wonderful spiritual connection to our Heavenly Father. And the first is living as though nothing has changed. Because the moment we turned to Jesus, we became somebody completely new, new creations. God delights in you and loves you. And that's based not on your actions, but on his grace. And if you follow Jesus, your identity is not based on your past, but on Jesus's past. However, even though we've now been born into his family and we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings himself, princes and princesses, if you like, it's very easy to retain the mindset of an orphan, to think that nothing has really changed. We're going to declare confidently together, out loud, the truths from the list that you'll find in your books entitled, No Longer Orphans. So let's declare confidently, out loud, the truths from the list entitled, No Longer Orphans. Let's go for it. Father God, Thank, Thank you that, that you, you did not leave me as an orphan. orphan. Thank, Thank you that so I can now cry to you, Abba, Father. Father. I refuse to believe the lie that I am an orphan. orphan. I choose to believe the truth that I have been born into your family and am now your much-loved child. I refuse to believe the lie that in order for you to love me, I have to do things to please you. I choose to believe the truth that you love me just as I am because you are love. I refuse to believe the lie that I have to strive for your attention. I choose to believe the truth that you always give me your full attention. I refuse to believe the lie that you will reject me if I don't perform well. I choose to believe the truth that you accept me completely even when I fail. I refuse to believe the lie that I have to provide for myself. I choose to believe the truth that you promise to give me everything I need. I refuse to believe the lie 
that I can trust only myself. I choose to believe the truth that you promised to help me and I can trust you completely. I refuse to believe the lie that no one really knows me or cares about me. I choose to believe the truth that you knew me before the creation of the world and that Jesus would have died just for me if I had been the only person who needed him to. I refuse to believe the lie that I had to compare myself to others. I choose to believe the truth that I am unique and that you value and love me for who I am. I refuse to speak badly of myself. I choose to speak about myself the same way you speak about me. I refuse to believe the lie that I deserve punishment or illness. I choose to believe the truth that Jesus took all the punishment I deserved. I declare that I want to be whole, well and fruitful. And by your grace, that is what I will be. Amen. Well done. Let's just pause briefly and reflect on what we've just read. I recommend that you read it through again, maybe a couple of times, slowly. And as you do that, just think to yourself, what are the top three of these for me? What are the top three lies that I've believed. And there is a place in your books to list those top three lies. So go do that now. Okay, so as we come back, let's look at the second area where we can fail to get the benefits of our connection to God. This section is entitled, Reaping What I Sow. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So our actions have consequences. God loves us and he tells us what's good for us and what's bad for us. And if we choose to do what's bad for us, then we'll face the consequences of that. So let's pray this prayer together. Father God, I recognise that in the way you have chosen to set the world up, my choices and actions have consequences. I confess that I have believed the lie that my choices and actions do not have consequences and have lived accordingly. Please show me now the areas of my life where I have not taken responsibility for my actions. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, as usual, there's a list of things to consider in your guide. The space to add some things of your own as the Holy Spirit prompts you. And then there's the prayer to deal with them. So take some time over that now. So let's move on to the third area. The third area is unresolved personal sin. It's clear from the Bible that sometimes sin leads directly to sickness. In Exodus 7 verses 14 to 11 and 10, Egypt suffered deadly plagues where Pharaoh disobeyed God. King Uzziah's pride led him into disobedience, and the consequence was leprosy. Elimis, the sorcerer, was struck blind when he blatantly opposed God. Sickness in the church in Corinth came from eating and drinking judgment on themselves because they were handling the bread and the wine wrongly. The church in Thyatira is one that sickness will come unless they repent of sexual immorality. Let's pray the prayer together to ask God 
to show us where there are any unresolved sin issues in our lives, whether or not they have led to sickness, so that we can deal with them here and now. Let's pray. Father, please show me now the, all the areas in my life where I have sinned against you and given ground in my life to the enemy so that I may turn away from that sin and resist the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, there is a list of possible items you may need to deal with and a prayer. If you list sexual sin, there's some further action to do after that. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 to 17, Paul explains that if a child of God whose spirit is joined to God's spirit, joins sexually with a prostitute, or indeed anyone, they become one flesh. This is not just a physical bonding they become spiritually bonded together. It's important to deal with that bond. So take a moment and ask God to bring to your mind the names of all the people with whom you have had sexual relationships outside marriage, and then pray the prayer that asks God to break those sinful bonds. No matter how many past sexual experiences you may have had or what they were, they do not change your new identity as a holy one. You are completely forgiven. You are clean and pure in Christ. So the fourth area we're going to cover that can stop us enjoying all the benefits of our spiritual connection to God is a negative inheritance from our family line. We all have a negative inheritance from our parents, grandparents, and other ancestors. We're not guilty for our parents' sin, it's important that we know that, but because all parents sin, there are consequences of their sin that will affect us. And this concept of passing sins on from one generation to another is a well-attested social phenomenon. For example, abusers have usually themselves been abused. Now, the debate in the world, of course, is whether this passing down of negative stuff from one generation to the next is down to the environment you grew up in, or whether it's somehow a vulnerability to a certain thing that is programmed into your genes. Well, we think that both of those things happen. Though it's important to know when it comes to talking about genetics, that personal choice trumps genetic vulnerabilities. Just because you might have a set of genes that makes you more vulnerable to, say, alcoholism, that's absolutely no reason whatsoever to assume that it is somehow inevitable that you will become an alcoholic. It isn't. The choices that you make are much more important than the genetic vulnerability. But as well as physical stuff, genes, an environment, it's kind of mental stuff if you like, this passing negative things down the generations clearly also happens at a spiritual level too. And there are a number of passages in the Bible that indicate this. Uh, the most significant one uh, is this piece, which is from the Ten Commandments itself, when God said, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, this is the key bit, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. That's Exodus 20, 4 to 6. And it's clear that the iniquities of one generation can cause adverse consequences spiritually in future generations, unless, of course, those sins of the ancestors are dealt with through confession, renunciation. So we are going to ask the Holy Spirit 
to reveal to us sins and iniquities that have come down to us from previous generations. And indeed, uh, we can have a go at anything and just see, see what God does. Um, there we, can, we can include the physical inheritance that's been passed down through our genes or vulnerability to a certain sin. We can include mental inheritance in terms of customs, practices and ways of thinking that we have picked up. Now, for example, if your mum and dad left pornography around the house, you are probably going to struggle with that issue or at least be more vulnerable to struggling with that issue than somebody else. If your parents said something like, you're never going to amount to anything, and you believe that, then of course you will struggle that with that. And our parents will have modelled negative attitudes to us perhaps, such as an unwillingness to take responsibility or an unhealthy lifestyle, and we just may find ourselves going the same way, doing the same stuff. It may be that a spiritual inheritance uh, in that their sin has opened the door for the enemy to influence not just their lives, but the lives of their descendants. In our experience, it's things like sexual sin, involvement in the occult, or se including secret societies such as Freemasons in one generation that seems particularly to affect subsequent generations. We can't change our physical inheritance, but we can choose to change the way we think and act. And we can take our stand against spiritual issues from the past and stop them affecting us and future generations. Just to encourage you, we don't need to work out whether a particular issue is genetic, mental or spiritual. We're just gonna ask God to show us all the specific negative things we've inherited from our ancestors, and we're just gonna take our stand against all of them and then guard our minds. Does that sound good? In that case, let's pray the prayer for this part. Father God, thank you for the positive inheritance I have from my parents, grandparents, and other ancestors. I recognize, however, that I have inherited negative things from them too. And today I choose to take my stand against those so that as far as it is within my power, I may put a stop to them. Please reveal to me now the negative influences that have come to me through my family line. In Jesus' name, amen. So spend some time now and let the Holy Spirit show you the items that you need to address. It's worth noting that you don't necessarily know about all the things that happened in previous generations. Well, you don't. And it may be that the Holy Spirit prompts you about something, for example, some sexual immorality. Um, well, just have a go at it, uh, regardless of whether it happens to be true or not. There's no harm done <laughs> if you address something that didn't actually happen, but there could be harm if you leave something in place that did happen. There's wrong behavior patterns, there's sins, and then there's illnesses and diseases. And as always, the suggestions aren't meant to be exhaustive. And we're not saying we know where they came from or whether they'll be addressed uh, in terms of being solved through this, but spiritual stuff will be. So when you feel you know everything that you want to address, say the prayer which addresses each part of the list separately. So go back and look at that list again and consider it. Take a bit of time and put a little circle around the sins or attitudes that you've identified that you recognize that you are vulnerable to repeating. You see, now that the spiritual root is dealt with, you can choose to renew your mind using stronghold busting in order to bring your belief system into line with God's word. So we now come to past events. All of us have suffered from difficult things in our lives and often they can continue to exert a negative influence on our thinking even many years later unless we choose to put a stop to it. 
Now, the crucial thing to understand is that it's not the traumatic events themselves that are the problem. It's the lies that those events have caused us to believe that stay with us and do the damage. So in order to break free, we need to recognise those lies and then choose to bring our belief system in line with what is actually true. So let's pray the prayer out loud together. Lord God, I joyfully declare the truth that nothing that happened to me in the past changes anything about my new identity in Jesus. Regardless of what I did or what others did to me, I am a holy one. I am clean. You delight in me. Please bring to my mind now the difficult events from my past that you want me to deal with today. And please help me to understand the faulty beliefs that I have taken from those events so that I can take steps to renew my mind and be transformed. In Jesus' name, Amen. So first of all, spend some time simply allowing the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind the difficult events from the past that he wants you to deal with today and write them down. When you're sure that you've listed them all, start to consider those events and how they made you feel. So for example, you may have felt dirty or guilty or shameful or useless rejected, hopeless, inferior. Write those words down. And when you've finished, put a circle around any of the words that describe how you still feel today. And then ask yourself whether or not those words are actually true of a holy child of God. Try and find verses from God's word that describe what is actually true. And you'll see then that a declaration can be made to, for each of those words. You can write it out. Each of those words that you recognize as a lie, you can write out a declaration of what is actually true. I'll leave you some time to do that now. Making those declarations is an important start, but it's only a start. It takes time and effort to change the way that you have learned to think, but it is well worth it. Imagine how different your life could be if you did not have to live with those faulty beliefs anymore. Let that spur you on to use stronghold busting to tear them down. We come now to a critical area, the area of forgiveness. God commands you to forgive because he loves you. And unforgiveness gives the enemy a foothold in your life, a spiritual route that could conceivably be a doorway to illness. It also affects your thinking negatively, another possible route of physical problems. So let's pray the prayer together. Father God, thank you that you command me to forgive because you love me and want me to be a fruitful disciple with nothing holding me back from doing the things you have prepared for me to do. I ask you to show me now all the people that I need to forgive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, simply spend time writing down names that the Holy Spirit brings to your mind. Don't worry about why you need to forgive them. Just write down the names. You might like to cast your mind back to your earliest memories from childhood even up till now. And then move gradually through to your life scanning every situation that you've come through. Take plenty of time to let this Holy Spirit show you who you need to forgive. 
For example, members of your family, friends, church leaders, even medical professionals. Just write the names down. Before you move on, consider whether you should add two further names to this list. God and yourself. God is perfect and has done nothing wrong. However, forgiveness is primarily about what we feel rather than what is objectively true. Have you felt that God has let you down or that he was not there for you in a particular situation? Are you holding God responsible for a particular illness or for not healing a particular health issue? Then consider adding yourself to the list. God has already forgiven you completely, but do you need to catch up with that and forgive yourself for bad choices you made and wrong things that you did? This may be particularly relevant if you are struggling with some of the consequences of those actions. The reason we find it so difficult to forgive someone who has hurt us is because we want to see justice done. Understandably, we want them to pay for what they did. Perhaps we have the impression that in commanding us to forgive, God is asking us to sweep what was done under the carpet to say it didn't matter. But of course, it did matter very much. Romans 12, 19 says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. When you forgive, although you are letting the person off your hook, you are not letting them off God's hook. You're taking a step of faith to trust God to be the righteous judge who will make everything right by demanding full payment for everything done against you. Nothing will be swept under the carpet. Everyone who has sinned against you will have to stand before God and explain it. Either it will be paid by the blood of Jesus, if the person follows Jesus, or they will have to face the judgment of God if they do not follow Jesus. So you can make the choice to hand all of that pain and those demands for justice over to God, safe in the knowledge that justice will be done. But in the meantime, you can walk free of it. So how do we forgive? Jesus says we need to forgive from the heart. That means being emotionally honest about what has, has been done to us and just how much it hurt us. We have to face the pain and the hate that we feel. We have to be honest with God. This is not easy, but it is essential. We will continue to suffer spiritual torment, negative emotions, and possibly physical illness until we forgive. We can move on from the past until we forgive. We won't be able to do what God has prepared for us to do until we forgive. We won't be fruitful disciples until we forgive. No, it definitely isn't easy. But you do it in order to resolve, completely resolve this issue and get rid of the pain that you have been carrying around. You may feel that you can't forgive, but recognize that if God commands you to forgive, then by definition, you can do it. You can do it. Don't wait until you feel like forgiving because that day will never come. Just make the choice to do it for your own good. So for each person on your list, pray as directed in your book. 
Father God, I choose to forgive, and you say the name of the person, for what they did or failed to do. So you say things like, you know, they did not provide for you, uh, they, they hit you, they abused you, any of those things which made you feel, you say how you, it made you feel, tell God, you felt abandoned, you felt rejected, you felt uh, 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 abused and depressed and anxious. You may like to write down what you say after what made me feel, because those words will often help you identify strongholds. If you say a word more than once, put a mark against it, so you can see how many times you use that same word. The words you use most are likely to be the most significant strongholds for you. Then complete this session by praying the prayer of blessing for those on your list who are still alive. So on one occasion, Jesus came across someone who'd been an invalid for 38 years. And before he healed him, he asked him a really important question. Do you want to get well? It's a really important question for us too, if we have a long-term health issue. Because being sick can become part of our identity. It can bring us support, love, care, even money. And we may find it difficult to give those things up. So the thought of getting better can actually be quite scary. So it's important to be honest about that and about what we might gain from our illness and then to make a definite decision that we do want to be well. And in terms of getting our identity from our sickness, we also need to think about how do we tend to speak about health issues? Do we talk about my sickness or do we speak negative things about ourselves because of a health issue. Let's ask God to show us. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you want me to be whole. Thank you that nothing is hidden from you. You know all my thoughts, words and deeds and yet love me always. Please show me now any ways in which I have allowed sickness to become part of my identity and any other ways I may be holding on to it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as usual, you have a, a list of possible items. Uh, so mark the ones that apply to you, add any others that God shows you, and then deal with them in the prayer that follows. So we're now going to move on to a section called Regaining Your Freedom from Compulsive Behaviours and Addictions. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, some of the Corinthians quote a saying, I have the right to do anything. Paul doesn't contradict them, but he says this, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So in other words, even Christians who've been set free by Jesus can allow things to master them and can return to being slaves to sin. Even good and wholesome things can still master us. If we cross a line and we start using them to fill places which were meant to be filled by God. So as well as giving the enemy a foothold in our lives, compulsive behaviours can lead to physical and mental health problems. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1. So the first step towards freedom from addiction is to be honest enough to recognise that you have a problem in a particular area. So we're going to pray together a prayer. Father God, thank you that it is for freedom that Jesus set me free and that I no longer have to be a slave to sin. I confess, however, that I have made wrong choices and have allowed sin to master me. 
Please show me now all the areas where I am not walking in complete freedom so I can take hold of my freedom and stand firm in Jesus' name. Amen. So consider the list of things that we can typically become addicted to. As usual, there may be other things that are relevant to you that you can add to that list. And then pray the prayer to confess and turn away from the things that you've listed. I think you're getting the idea that much of what we've been dealing with is a battle between truth and lies. What are the lies that draw you towards addictions? For example, that I can drink as much alcohol as I like without any consequences. That food will bring me real comfort. Lasting change will come as you choose to renew your mind to the truth of God's word. Consider whether it will be helpful to make yourself accountable to someone as you move forward. Contact them today while the thought is fresh in your mind. Do you recognize that you need to seek medical or professional help? Again, take the step today. Let's consider how we have viewed our physical bodies, which are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And let's pray together. Father God, thank you for my physical body. Thank you for its amazing design and the way you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I really am fearfully and wonderfully made. Please show me now the ways in which I have not honored you in my body or have believed lies about it. In Jesus' name, amen. So consider the list and pray the following prayer for the items that are relevant to you. So take a moment now to consider before God specific changes it will be good to make in your diet, exercise or rest patterns. Write them down and commit each one of them to God in prayer. So hopefully we're going to see lots of renewed Christians about the place as you put all that into practice. We're going to move on to consider anxiety. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Part of humbling ourselves under God's hand is to do with letting go of our own agenda for our lives and considering whether our life goals are in line with his goal for us. A life goal is a goal that you've developed for your life that feels so important to you that you measure your whole success as a person against it. The point is that if you are feeling anxious a lot, it's a strong indication that you may well be working towards a life goal that feels uncertain to you. In other words, its fulfillment depends on people or circumstances that are not under your direct control. And that's not a life goal that God wants you to have. Let's pray the prayer together. Father, Father God, God, you, you are, are so much bigger than, than I can imagine. imagine. You know the end from the beginning. Your ways are perfect. I confess that I have tried to run my life myself rather than letting you do it. I have tried to control people and events that are beyond my ability to influence. As a result, I have often felt anxious. I humbly ask you to show me where I have developed life goals that do not align with your goal for my life, to become more and more like Jesus in character. In Jesus' name, amen. So consider the list 
uh, and ask yourself if there are things there that may be worthy things in themselves, but you have allowed them to become too important, in effect to become idols, and then pray the prayer that follows. Now, are there circumstances in your life happening at this moment that you are finding difficult or even overwhelming? Let's go on to consider those by praying the next prayer. Lord God, Lord God you, you have, have commanded me in your word not, not to be anxious. anxious. I, I recognize, recognize therefore that it must be entirely possible for me to live without anxiety. I bring you the situations that are causing me anxiety and ask you to give me wisdom to separate facts from assumptions and understand what my responsibility is in each situation. In this time of reflection, Please help me see my present circumstances as they really are. Thank you that you have promised me that you will not let me be tested beyond what I can bear and that you are working in every situation for my good. In Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, simply list the circumstances in your life that are difficult and are causing you ongoing anxiety. Then for each one of those, work through the short exercise in your books, concluding with the prayer. So following on from anxiety, um, we're going to now think about fear. We'll now ask God to help us deal with unhealthy fear. And that's to say, a fear that is not a reasonable response to what's happening. So, for example, being paralysed by a small spider in the corner of the room, or thinking that we're going to get ill at any moment, or sleeping with the light on because we're fearful of the dark. So, for a fear to be healthy, it has to have two attributes. It has to be both present and powerful. Every unhealthy fear comes from believing that an object is both present and powerful when it's not. So in other words, there's a lie behind every unhealthy fear. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord God, please show me where I have been fearful and help me work out the lie behind each fear. In Jesus' name, Amen. So first of all, simply mark the fears that you recognise. There may be some other fears to add to that list as well that Holy Spirit reminds you of. Then spend some time trying to work out the lie behind each one. Remember, to be legitimate, a fear has to be both present and powerful. And most lies are to do with thinking that a particular thing is present or powerful when in fact it isn't. Then see if you can find a verse from the Bible that says what's actually true. Now, it may take a little bit of time to work that out, but it's worth trying to be very specific about it. And when you've finished, for every unhealthy fear, pray the prayer at the end of the section. So take some time to do that now. We remember that to die is gain. So let's move on to think about a specific fear, the fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 tells us that Christ died, that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery 
by their fear of death. So we can't remove the presence of death. Unless Jesus comes back first, the one thing in life that we can be 100% sure of is that our physical body will die. But we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's from 1 Corinthians 15. Death is no longer powerful. It has lost its sting. The Bible promises that heaven will be a place free from tears, pain and mourning. And it's healthy to live in the light of the death of our physical body and to take the same attitude that Apostle Paul had when he was under the threat of a possible death sentence. He wrote this from prison, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So let's pray the prayer together. Father God, I joyfully declare the truth that Jesus died to break the power of the devil and to free me from the fear of death. I choose to live in that freedom. I reject and turn away from the fear of death. I declare the truth that when my body dies, my spirit will live on with you. Death has lost its sting and no longer holds any power over me. I entrust myself completely to you. May you decide the timing and manner of my physical death. In the meantime, I commit myself to fruitful labor in your kingdom in the power of your Holy Spirit. Please use me to the fullest possible extent to do the works you've prepared in advance for me to do. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. In this session, we're going to consider living as a fruitful disciple with chronic illness. So if you have a chronic health condition, it's important to know the truth that we are not defined by any illness or limitation, but we are defined by what our Heavenly Father says about us. There is mystery around why God sometimes miraculously intervenes to heal, and sometimes he doesn't. After we have done everything that is in our power to do, we can simply entrust our bodies to God as living sacrifices, confident that he can use us fully as disciples, whether we are healed or not. Our wholeness, our fruitfulness, and our freedom do not depend on being healed. We have a prayer in which all of us can commit ourselves to God as living sacrifices. Let's pray this together. Father, Father thank you that Jesus, Jesus died and rose again so that I can be whole and fruitful. Thank you that your divine power has already given me everything I need to live a godly life and that my wholeness and fruitfulness do not depend in any way on being physically healed. I present to you my whole being as a living sacrifice. Be glorified in me, Father. Do what you want to do in me and through me. I put into your hands the question of my physical healing. Please show me if there is anything more I need to do. Otherwise, I simply wait for you and I trust you. Your ways are far above my ways. You are good, loving and powerful. I put my trust solely in you. I rejoice in you. I worship you with the whole of my being. I forgive those who have implied that I have not been healed because I do not have enough faith. 
or because there is some other thing wrong with me. I thank you for your words to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Thank you that you are true of me too. Your grace is enough. Your power is made perfect in my weakness. Please help me live within my physical limitations. But nevertheless, please use me to the fullest possible extent as a disciple of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So having submitted to God, we now need to do the other half of the verse and we need to resist the devil. And when we do that, he has no choice but to do what? Flee from us. He doesn't just depart in an orderly fashion. He flees from us. So we have a closing prayer to pray together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for leading me in this process. Thank you for showing me my sin and reassuring me of your forgiveness and love. Having submitted to you by confessing my sin, I now resist the devil as you command me. I tell every enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave me. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well done. Very good. So during this process, you've been assuming your responsibility to pray, to confess sin. You've submitted to God and you've just resisted the devil. If you still have a health issue, there's one thing it remains for you to do biblically. It's to ask the elders of your church to anoint you with oil and pray for you as James instructs. You can look it up in James 5, verses 13 to 16. And when you've done all you can do, followed all those instructions, we would expect that if you have a physical issue that's caused by a spiritual root, we would expect it to disappear at that point. If the illness continues, it would be reasonable to assume that this is not an issue with a spiritual root. And I think that you can take some sense of closure on that. Now, if you are going through this process as part of a group in your church, this is the time when your elders can now come and anoint you with oil and pray for your healing. If you have been going through this process on your own, now would be a good time to get on the phone and contact the elders of your church, explain to them what you've done and ask them if you could make an appointment with them so that they can anoint you with oil and pray for your healing in accordance with the clear instructions in the New Testament. If you're not in a church, I'd encourage you to join one. Now, one thing that you might like to do right now before you finish for today is take a look back at what you've written and make a list of the lies, the faulty beliefs that have come out, that have become apparent to you during this process. There are a number of places where you've identified false beliefs, uh, especially perhaps the section where you forgave other people if you wrote down uh, how it made you feel. Um, look for repeated occurrences throughout the process of the same word. Common words that might be repeated by people would include inadequate, inferior, hopeless, or whatever. None of those things is true for anybody who's a follower of Jesus. Then pick the most significant one. Don't try to do too many, just do one at a time. Pick the most significant one and develop a stronghold buster. There are instructions for that in the notes for session three, session three, of course, in your participant's guide. When you finish that one to your satisfaction and you know that that belief has changed and it will change, go on to the most or the next most significant lie and so on. A year from now, you could have done six, seven, eight of those and you would be amazed at how different your life could be as you kick out those faulty beliefs 
one after another. This is a way of life. In conclusion, there really is nothing more satisfying than living a righteous life. And during this time, you've cleared the decks. You have taken away some rubbish and it has set the stage for you to go out in wholeness, to live as a fruitful disciple of Jesus and get on with doing the things that God has prepared specifically for you. So go for it. Thank you.